And uh, before we kick off, I would like to give a, a brief introduction um, to the eRemote project, which has uh, enabled us to, uh, to run this webinar today and to Eurobio Imaging and Instruct. So eRemote is, is a European project that uh, will still run until um, the uh, last quarter of uh, this year uh, with the objective to build uh, a foundation of knowledge and uh, a collection of best practices for uh, research infrastructures, how to offer remote and digital solutions to their users. And this, of course, was a project that was born out of the, the pandemic and out of the needs that were seen there when a lot of um, offers at research infrastructures came to a halt. Uh, it uh, wants to build a public knowledge database with uh, tools and uh, technologies that can be employed by infrastructures for remote access. And, and this video will, will be part of that uh, training offer as well. And it aims to provide a set of recommendations for research infrastructures to uh, further develop remote and digital processes across all RI domains. We can see here on the map uh, the project partners, and uh, we, among the project partners, we teamed up here, Eurobio Imaging, with Instruct Eric because we are both um, offering electron microscopy services, and and both have a range of uh, facilities that um, provide access to EM, and thought that this would be a very useful uh, training for this community. The E-remote work uh, project, how it has operated was that it offered a number of workshops and expert group meetings that uh, first aim to identify challenges in remote training and remote operations uh, mainly, and then uh, delve further into the discussion with experts on uh, topics such as remote and virtual access, sample handling, quality assurance, data sharing and data access and security, remote training for RI staff uh, and researchers, remote instrument control and international access and accessibility of RI services. And, and out of these workshops and expert uh, group discussions, um, there were several gaps identified and uh, particularly the need to have a more in-depth and advanced training on how to operate electron microscopes remotely was flagged by our community and this is why we approached uh, the companies and approached size here to team up with us to offer this workshop just a brief word on on Eurobioimaging. so Eurobioimaging is uh, as you're probably aware the pan-european research infrastructure for biological biomedical imaging we are uh, distributed across 18 countries and uh, the embl here in heidelberg where i am based we have uh, 41 nodes and 237 sites that together offer uh, more than 120 different imaging technologies that range really all the way from uh, the very small atomic force microscopy, for example, to up to preclinical and clinical imaging in humans. And we are a publicly funded not-for-profit organization providing access to uh, researchers all across Europe and, and the globe to imaging instruments and image services and data services. And uh, you can see here a list of, of our nodes that provide uh, electron microscopy services. They are really scattered all out, uh, across Europe. We have a, a large number of nodes offering this, and we also have a broad portfolio of electron microscopy services that are on offer and that you can access through our infrastructure. And we also have an industry board because we closely want to uh, work together with our industry partners to um, basically do things like this joint training to, to reach out to the community and really respond to the needs of, uh, of our facility staff also. Um, when it comes to imaging technology. And we're very happy to have uh, Zeiss on the board, who has been really a very active member and, and very supportive. And we are um, happy to be able to organize quite a few activities together and uh, have you today on this workshop. 
And with this, I hand over to Corinna for a few words on Instra. Yes, thank you, Claudia. So also on behalf of Instruct, a uh, very warm welcome to this EM workshop today. So I'm uh, Corinna Bockhaus and I'm working as a project manager at Instruct Eric. We are uh, the leading structural biology research infrastructure, providing um, access to high end technologies and training to the research community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so our service portfolio um, comprises more than 80 different services from sample preparation, biomolecular analysis to 3D analysis. For example, in, in the um, sample preparation category, we offer crystallization, nanobody discovery and protein production with a range of uh, different expression systems. For biomolecular analysis, we have high-end imaging technologies, mass spectrometry and molecular biophysics. For example, uh, SPR or thermal shift assay, just to name a few. And then for 3D analysis, uh, we offer X-ray techniques, NMR and electron microscopy. And as you can see, um, these um, services are offered all across facilities all across Europe. Next slide, please. And since this is an uh, CRIUM uh, workshop, I wanted to uh, highlight this uh, technology or our service uh, in, in particular. Um, so the CRIUM service is actually a, a quite popular uh, services among uh, our community. Um, about 30 to 40% of all um, access provision through Instruct uh, is CRIUM. Uh, and here we, we offer services um, for the complete um, yeah, cryium uh, pipeline from sample preparation for cryium to cryoclam uh, high end data collection for both cryoem and also uh, cryoelectron tomography. And once you have obtained uh, your data set, we also offer support in EM uh, image data processing. And uh, yeah, as you can see, um, we, we, we um, offer this service at a range uh, of facilities uh, located all across Europe. And um, this service is also available both in person and as remote access. Okay, thank you. If there's a handover back to you, Claudia. Yes, thank you very much, Corinna. And uh, I'm showing you here the agenda for today. So as mentioned before, we will have uh, a brief introduction. Uh, welcome from Sven Terklavas from Zeiss to this workshop. Uh, and then we will hand over to Andre who will, uh, first of all, um, give us some general overview of a remote uh, control of a FIPSAM, and then uh, present a, a use case and show some practical uh, work at the microscope directly. Uh, then we have Luca, who will uh, introduce to us the Zeiss Predictive Service, which will help with remote uh, diagnosis and, and maintenance. And uh, we will finish off with uh, Johannes, who will uh, join us uh, later to uh, talk a little bit about uh, IC, uh, IT security. So if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. We will take maybe one, two questions after each uh, um, presentation. And then we have time for Q&A at the end to answer all your questions. So with this, I'll stop sharing and I would hand over to Andre, uh, no, Sven first to uh, <laughs> quickly introduce uh, the work. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And, and welcome to everyone from, from Zeiss and from myself in particular. So I'm Sven Klavers. I'm heading the, the team of imaging specialists for uh, EMEA LA. And it's an honor to be here. And, and thank you for the invitation, Claudia, and, and setting all of this up. Um, we, we do have a very close relationship with Eurobi Imaging, and it's exciting to, to be able to, to do all this and, and teach and help. Um, as a very brief introduction, um, we have here with us three speakers today, as you already mentioned. So we have Luca, we have Johannes and, and Andre. Um, so Luca, he has a background in industrial engineering and business administration and is focusing at, on data analytics and artificial intelligence. His current role is a product owner for predictive service. Uh, that's also what he will be uh, talking about uh, later on. He will also briefly touch um, IT security, but then hand over to Johannes Lang. Johannes Lang, he's uh, our business information security officer. Uh, he will go deeper into the IT security uh, topic. 
Um, and Johannes comes from the University of, of Mannheim, where he uh, achieved a Master of Science. And then last but not least, uh, Andre. Andre is waiting anxiously, I think, uh, to start with demonstrating and talking about our, uh, our EM. So Andre, he's uh, Andre uh, Majorovic. He's with Zeiss now for 17 years, if I'm right. And he has a background in physics with a side focus on biophysics. Um, he has both experience in, in HIM, so helium ion microscopy, as well as TEM and FIPSAM for uh, about 10 years now focusing on 3D data acquisition on our cryosam for both biology and materials research. And Andre works at the ZMCC in Oberkochen, which you're all invited to, to go and visit, obviously, as a FIPSAM application specialist for demonstration training, sample preparation, and uh, application development. And with this, uh, I will stop my, my chat here and I'm handing over to Andre. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sven, and good morning to everyone. So again, as mentioned by Sven, my name is Andro Majorovic, and I'm working at the Carl Zeiss Microscopy Center in Oberkochen as, an, as a FIPSAM application specialist. And in my role, I often get uh, customers who are asking me for support. So. For this reason, it is really a brilliant idea to have a good remote tool to, to be able to help the customers out there remotely. And uh, the same is also true for, for customer training. So especially during the pandemic, where we were not able to visit the customers on site, it was a very helpful thing to have remote tools and to give remote trainings and also we had the possibility to, to give a lot of remote demos and so we are still doing so also today we are giving a lot of online trainings if if demanded so i am in general what we are using to to get remote access is uh, or to get remote remote access is the team viewer so we're using team viewer to to remote into the customers systems and to support or give trainings and so on. I had a few cases where customers asked me to use AnyDesk to do so. And, and in fact, this, this was also possible. So in these cases, I did it. But as a standard and also for security reasons, we, we prefer to use the team viewer. So let me now guide you a bit through the possibilities that we have using the team viewer. Before I do this, let me just say, I am sitting in the Carl Zeiss Customer Center in Oberkochen. And let me just quickly, I stand up and I, I show you where I am. So I, I am in one of the rooms of the Customer Center where we have a focused iron beam, the FIPSAM, here in the background. And the FIPSAM is being controlled by us, typically using a hard panel, which you see here. And we have three monitors which allow us to, to control the system. Of course, today I will not, not touch the hard panel and, and uh, I will use mainly, well, all the time, I will now use my, um, my laptop that I'm sitting in front of, which has a 15.6 inch screen. And I'm just gonna use my, my, my normal mouse to, to do everything that I need to do. So let me now, share my screen with you. Okay. And I will now go to the team viewer. So I'm, I'm now connected to the system, which is next to me, but it could, I could sit in, in Mallorca or in South America and just do everything remotely. So I'm, I'm just gonna, you see, I'm connected with the team viewer and I'm just gonna hide hide this one here. So it's not in our way. Okay. So what you see on the screen now is the our graphical user interface called SmartZem, which many of you who are Zeiss users are familiar with if you are an EM user or FIPSEM user. So this is our SmartZem graphical user interface 
which you see, and you see that in, in, in the middle, we have a display area. At the moment, what you see is that you are able to look into the chamber of the FIPSAM using a TV camera. And that's what you see in the, in the main view at the moment. There are on the left side, there is another panel uh, also displaying the same thing at the moment. On the right side, there are the SEM control panels and other panels that can be put there. And actually, we are very free to move these things around. So I can undock them and redock them. I can also put this panel to the right side um, or and this, this panel uh, to, to the left side and so on. And this is very helpful. So if you are working remotely, it is really helpful to set up your screen and your display in the way that you really are used to have it at, in the customer center and to do the things most efficiently. Okay, so a lot of freedom to, to set it up. As mentioned at the moment in the middle, we have the, the TV camera and there are actually two TV cameras on the system. So if I switch from TV one camera to TV two camera, I have a different angle at which I can look onto my sample, but, but usually I'm using the TV one camera to do so. Good, so what you see here is uh, what I have in the microscope at the moment is a, is a carousel holder on top of which there are two stops mounted and on each of the stops there are some samples which I'm going to look at now. Okay, so let's now go to uh, the electron microscope image. So I switch to a different detector from TV detector basically to the secondary electron detector. And as you can see, I have, I'm looking at the first sample and the first sample is a, is a very straightforward sample. It's just a silicon wafer that we are often using for calibration purposes, testing purposes and so on. Okay, speaking about this, so we, what you see on the top is a, is a toolbar we have a, where I, we have a lot of buttons. And for instance, just to give you an idea, if, if I hit the save button, just clicking the save button, it is already possible just to save the image, the current image. And now, as I've seen, as you have seen before, we, I'm sitting in front of three screens as well, three monitors. So I'm just going to go here. So, and, and here is just the image that I, I have just um, saved at the moment. Okay, now talking about this toolbar. The, this toolbar is also a quite mighty thing. It is actually editable and I have the possibility to build my own toolbar. So there is a toolbar editor, which allows you to, to define different buttons in this toolbar. I can remove buttons if I hit the remove button or let me just um, create one. So let's, for instance, if I want to add a button, which should show up in the toolbar, I can do so. I can move it down. I can define the icon that should be displayed in the toolbar. And of course, I can give it a function. Now there is a really large variety of functions that can be assigned to each of these tool buttons. Just to show you, there's really a large list. For now, for this example, I will just go to assign a macro. So for instance, um, a few days ago, I have created a macro that is called mouse wheel contrast. And I, 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 I use this in a moment. So I added this, this button now. So I say, where is it? Add button, okay. And now you see that this button appeared in the toolbar and I'm able to use this. By the way, we are not able to change this toolbar and um, remove, modify, generate new buttons, but we can also save it. So we can, I, I can in principle save my, my toolbar that I have here and then send it by email to a customers where, where I want to to do online support, load it there, and then I will have this, the toolbar that I'm used to. 
Okay, so now I have a, a nice toolbar. Let me start scanning again. So we are scanning the image as I speak. And just to demonstrate the tool, the button that I just created, I linked it to my mouse wheel. So if I click on it, what will happen now if I move the mouse wheel and I'm now moving, I'm moving my mouse wheel. What happens, it changes the contrast because that was the macro that I linked to this button, which allows me to change the contrast just with my mouse wheel, for instance. Okay, there's more than that. So in order to be able to work remotely, it is very helpful to have a lot of short keys. And one of the really nice short keys is are the function keys on my laptop. So just by pressing the, the, the function key F9, which I will do now, will actually open a list of all the keyboard shortcuts that I have. Just as an example, uh, um, um, a, a key, which you see, it's a it's really a large list. You can, for instance, press Control D and Control D will toggle the data zone. I'll close this. And, and another one which I, I want to point out is that there are a lot of function keys that can edited and used defined by the user. So you can link all these function keys F5 to F8 and F5 shift to F8 shift to user defined macros. Let me close this now. So talking about this, uh, I had this example of control D and if I press control D, which I will now do now. So control D, you see, that in the bottom, there's the so-called data zone, which I can display or hide. This is just one possibility. Another possibility is for, for instance, what, what I have set up. So I, I mentioned that some function keys are user editable. I, I linked the magnification to my mouse wheel. So if, for instance, I press the function key F five, which I'm going to do now. So now I pressed F five. This allows me now just to use the mouse wheel to zoom in or zoom out from the image. Or alternatively, I have another one, F six. F six, I linked to the focusing. So now I, I, I just click, I, I hit the F six function key, and now I'm able to focus my image using the mouse wheel and that way you can you can you can link all kind of uh, functionalities to your mouse wheel and um, use them to remotely control your electron microscope just talking about the data zone which i have mentioned before the data zone is actually also uh, a nice tool to to influence parameters for instance i could change the electron energy from 2 kV, 2 kV, which it is now to 5 kV or something like that. I can switch detectors. For instance, I can switch to the inlands detector like this. Uh, now it would be nice by clicking to this button, which I've just defined before to change the contrast and so on. Double click, go back to the secondary electron detector. Okay, hit F5 to do the magnification change, and so on. Now, as I mentioned, I can link macros to function keys. So how does this work? In the tool panel, we have the so-called macro editor. And just for you to, to give you an example, I will load, I will load a macro. I will load the macro, which is linked to my function key F5. And then the way it goes is it has just the name F5. And that means for the program that as a standard, it will be linked to the function key. Okay, so let me open it. Now, don't be afraid. It's a very, very simple macro. It basically says if the imaging mode is in FIP mode, not SEM, but FIP mode, then the mouse wheel should influence the FIP magnification. 
otherwise so if the imaging mode is on SEM it will influence the SEM magnification very simple or as a different example F6 which I use to for focusing again if the imaging mode is on on the FIP and FIP mode then the mouse wheel will act on the FIP focus otherwise which means if it's in SEM mode it will um, it will act on the SEM focusing, which is called WD at the working distance. Okay. Good. This is the macro. Um, another thing that is really helpful for remote access is that we have individual logins. So each person can log in individually to this graphical user interface. The service has a certain login. I have my login, users have their login. And a lot of things can be transferred from one login to the other one. As I mentioned before, I can, I can save the toolbar on the top and load it whenever I go to a customer place or remotely have remote access to a customer microscope. I can load it and use the one that I'm used to. The same is true for the data zone. So the data zone, which I have down here, I can also define it. It in the way I want it to look like with all the parameters set that I'm mostly using, I can save. Now we have done, I showed you how to do imaging. I showed you how to quickly change the magnification. Let me see. Okay, we're imaging. I changed the magnification just using the mouse wheel. What I haven't shown you yet is how to move, quickly move the stage, how to easily move the stage. Now, let me store resolution. So one way is the classical way is just to, to put in the stage coordinates direct, directly. So for instance, I can type in go, please go to five degrees tilt. I hit okay. And now you see there's some movement on, on in, the, in the left TV display. You see that the system has been moved. I can, I can also, I can, I can also give it Delta. So I can, for instance, tell the system, please move X uh, by two millimeters and move Y by minus two millimeters. I had okay, hit okay. And it's doing this movement. Likewise, I can do this for the rotation and for all axes. There's actually a nice button, which is cool, called undo stage, stage go to. So if I click this, it will just undo the last movement that I've been doing. Okay, this is the standard way of doing it. Now there's a, a nice feature, which is called the, joist, the joystick or the soft joystick, which is very handy if I'm working remotely and I do not have the, the, the typical joysticks that, that, that I have um, on my hard panel. So for instance, I can, again, I can uh, use the stage vector T for tilting to tilt my stage. I can use the vector R for rotations, the vector Z for changing the height of my specimen and so on. So this is a very mighty tool to have. Let me just go to back to the stored position, to my starting position, which I called wafer, because this is my wafer sample. Okay, now other possibilities, also very useful. If I hold my shift key, I'm now holding the shift key on my laptop, and I'm gonna make a double click into this feature. And that will cause the stage to move there. So shift and double click causes, do it again, double click, move, moves there. Alternatively, I have the possibility to use a control tab functionality, which brings me up this green cross. And I can now select the area where I want to the stage to go, click, and the stage will move there. So again, control, tab, position the cross to a place to go, click, and the stage will go there. 
Now, this is a very handy tool to, to move the stage in X and Y. I also have another possibility. So, so you see here in the top left, we have a schematical overview of the carousel holder that is in my chamber. And I can just by simply clicking into this into the schematic view, I can change from one position to the other. Another tool I have is the so-called image navigation. Let me quickly show you that one. I can hide this one now. So when, when I load a new sample, I'm able to make a photo with a navigation camera that is attached to my airlock. And if I do, if I work remotely, I can ask a customer if he has such an FCAM on his system to take an image, a photo, during the process of transferring the sample into the chamber. And then I get something like this. So now you see, I have a photo of my, my sample. I, and also this one I can use to move around to whatever position I want to go to. Okay, now let me just go back to the standard starting position again. Good. And I will also go back to my TV view, which I really love to have because that makes it's, you know, it's always safety thing. You always are able to see what is happening in the chamber. I want to show you another tool, which is really helpful. There's a shortcut. It's the control I. I for me, it's always the, you know, like control information. With this control information or control I shortcut, I can open the so-called smart sim status window. And, and this is really a powerful tool if you if you work remotely, because in the select panel, you can select basically every available parameter on your tool. So I'm not going to go into details, but just as an as a, as an example, if I wanted to um, influence the magnification. So mag here, there's a parameter called mag for magnification. That's the SEM magnification. I can select it and then it will be displayed. And over here, I can double click on magnification, say 1K, hit OK. And the system will jump to this magnification. And, and this is, this is uh, the case also for other parameters I can for instance, um, change the CCD illumination. If I do EVX, I don't want to have light on my camera, for instance. So I can modify all these parameters using this SmartSum status window. And this is really mighty because I have so, so many parameters select from. So also for, for diagnose, diagnose purposes, this is a really um, helpful tool. Okay, let me go to the list what I wanted to show you. It's easy, of course, to, to, to change the, the scan speed. So there, there is a drop down menu here where I can go to faster or to slower scan speed. This is a slow scan speed. But also here, so my toolbar is set up in such a way that I have some standard buttons, which I can just press. The number one is like a live view, very fast scanning mode. The number two is something intermediate and the number three would be like to get a less noisy image. Likewise, I have this button here, the speed button, which if I click with the left mouse, it will increase. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm clicking with the left mouse button and this increases the scanning speed. Okay, so now I click more and more. And I click another time and it's really a fast scan. And if I click with the right mouse button, I can reduce the scan speed. So these are really quite handy possibilities to, to influence parameters. And I'm, I'm really I have this possibility not only to link the mouse wheel to functionalities, but the, the left mouse button or the right mouse button and then uh, evoke uh, an action. Okay, of course, we have something like reduced area imaging. We can go to reduced area 
and zoom in. zoom in and out. So now I'm going to press F5, you know, the function key, which is linked to magnification. I can hit Control Tab and bring a certain feature into the center. Hit F6 to switch the mouse wheel to focusing and so on. Then if I'm if I'm not happy, F5 again for zooming in. I might have to to improve on stigmation, for instance. Not a bit stigmation. Okay, focusing a bit better, and so on. So there's really it's it's quite handy to to work with all these tools. Good. I was talking about the shortcuts. Yes, the macro editor stage moved to joystick and okay good now so these are these are most of the functionalities that i wanted to introduce you inside smart Zen. there would be of course many more to to show but let me jump to another topic so some of you who are size users and size em users might know um, a software called atlas and I would like to give you a, a short introduction also about how to remotely control the Atlas software. Now, let me let me quickly start Atlas. Okay, now I'm going, going to see where it's going to open, on which of my three monitors it's going to open. It might open not on this monitor, then I'm going to switch to the other monitor. Good. So while it's opening, just to explain briefly, Atlas, the Atlas program has basically two functionalities. Function A is to provide the user with a correlative workspace. And here I see it opened on a different monitor. Here it is. Okay, so Atlas provides the user with a correlative workspace. This means that if, for instance, you have acquired a nice set of LM images, you can import those into your workspace, then go to the SEM, start imaging, align the two coordinate systems with respect to each other, and then you can go to selected regions of interest that you have selected in your LM, in your LM job, based on the LM images, and navigate to those areas. So this is a, a great thing, and you can do this with LM images. You can import images from a different SEM. You can import also X-ray data and so on to work correlatively. This is just a side note. So now the functionality B of Atlas is also just to collect data into this correlative workspace. And since this is a re remote workshop, I'm going to go and to concentrate on showing you how to work remotely in terms of just acquiring images and how to modify parameters here. So like in the smart SEM user interface, I have the possibility also here to influence my beam parameters. For instance, I can just also using the mouse wheel influence the detector brightness and the detector contrast. For instance, I, I put my mouse over this, uh, this uh, the toggler and I'm now going to move my mouse wheel. So, and you see it's influencing the contrast in this case. Let me switch from coarse changes to fine changes. So now this allows me to have finer changes. I Alternatively, I can also use these arrows here if I want to have super fine changes and likewise i can zoom in or zoom out by using the arrows or just by using the mouse wheel again this is also true for the focus so let's let let me first of all zoom in a bit increase the brightness a bit it's too much maybe okay i can also here use a sub area which I can define, move around. I can change its size and so on if I want to do some focusing. So let me zoom in a bit more and then just switching to the focusing area. I can do 
my focusing. Oh, this doesn't change too much. So go back to, to cores. Now I have larger changes in focusing. And another thing that uh, I haven't mentioned before in SmartSim, but I, I will mention it now here, there is a focus wobble. This is used for the aperture align. So in, in case I need to do some alignment here. Okay, so now you see it got worse. So I go a few steps back. Okay, to bring the wobbler to 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 um, basically pump uh, isotropically. Okay, so I have all the functionalities that I need to align my beam and to get an, a nice image. I can on the left side change beam parameters such as the KEV and the beam current and so on. A nice thing uh, that we can also use here, let me show you that as well, is the autofocus. Let me just um, go back to full, full frame imaging. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a bit. And of course, for autofocus functionality, you need you need some some features on on your area, but we have some here. So there is uh, in the tool pa tools panel. There is something called autofocus. I can press autofocus. Autofocus. Okay. And then it's going to execute the autofocus. And uh, likewise, I could also do an autostigmation. So if, uh, if I have some astigmatism on the system, I can press the auto stick button and do an automatic stigmation, which is, well, sometimes quite handy if, you, if you're working remotely. Okay, it's almost done with the autofocus. Okay, good. So now um, one functionality within the Atlas is the so-called Atlas 3D nanotomography. So I'm just quickly opening this to show you what kind of functionality is this. I'm not going to in, into details because um, th this is uh, the Atlas 3D is a, a program which allows you to do a high resolution 3D FIPSIM data acquisition. And as I said, I'm not going too much into it details, just to briefly show you uh, what kind of things you can, can do here. You can, for instance, uh, define a sample preparation and it is schematically displayed over here, which basically shows you how uh, a sample preparation will be done in terms of depositing a platinum or carbon on top of uh, the area that you want to mill away and then do some trenches to create a cross section. In this case, also create some side trenches to, to um, create a freestanding volume that you're later on milling away to collect some 3D data. Okay, this, this was just to mention that we have this uh, Atlas 3D as part of Atlas. And, and with, I'm going to close this now, this Miss Atlas 3D setup. Le a bit later on, I will, my use case will also be a FIPSAM 3D data acquisition, but not using Atlas 3D, but I'm going back to SmartSim now. Before I do so, let me close the Atlas program. And I think, now it is maybe the time to give you the possibilities to um, ask a few questions. Okay, I'm still at this location over here. And I am now going to move to, to the other sample that you see on the left side in the TV camera image. I've saved it, of course. It's called Gila because this sample area and with f5 i can zoom out and show you how it looks like okay so basically i zoomed out a lot now uh, so you see there's a chunk of resin embedded hela cells which is attached to a stub uh, using silver paste which you see over here and over here and as you also can tell, I have already 
milled uh, not only one but several trenches into this uh, HeLa cell sample in order to collect 3D data. And this is my use case. So, so I have I have um, this area over here, and I have actually also put a protection pad. I think it was it's a sandwich. Of, it was an Atlas 3D prep actually. I have done a sample prep. I have milled a trench in front of the area to be uh, collected. And I'm now going to tilt the stage to 54 degrees. And while tilting, let me just quickly ex explain why I'm tilting to 54 degrees. So, okay, we have, you see the TV camera view. Um, what you see on the top is the SEM objective lens. And from the to uh, top right, what you see is the FIB. Now, there is an angle between, of course, between the, the electron beam, which comes from the top, and the FIB, which comes from the top right. There is an angle of 54 degrees. And usually, I want to mill into the sample perpendicularly. And that's why I tilted the sample to 54 degrees, such that the FIB, which is coming from here, is milling and looking at perpendicular to the sample surface. Good. Oh, a very, uh, okay, now let me go back to the secondary electron detector. So you see, and I'm, I'm going to move the sample to the center of the image. I'm zooming in a bit and now one one thing that i uh, we haven't talked about yet, yet i'm showing the fib control here so at the moment it, in what you see in green here it's it tells me the fib is on so i'm and it's also open so and it's set to 50 pico amps so in principle i can just quickly switch to the fib mode and i can do so either by going through here just to select the FIP mode. Or alternatively, I have the shortcut F8. So again, there is a very nice shortcut, which I'm hitting now, the F8 function key, to switch between SEM mode, one hand, and FIP mode on the other hand. Okay, so I'm zooming in a bit. I'm moving the area of interest right into the center. So later on, I will be able to uh, put a a milling box around this area and set up my milling job. But first of all, I will concentrate on my SEM imaging. Let me, so once I've set up the position of the sample, I'm using the SEM beam shift to bring the area of interest into the center. And I'm zooming in a bit more. Oh, and by the way, so since now I'm looking at a tilted surface, I need to apply a tilt correction, which is at an angle of 36 degrees. So the sample surface is at an angle of 30, uh, sorry, 54 degrees, but the cross section phase, which is perpendicular to the surface of the sample, is at an inclination of 36 degrees. That's why I have 36. And in addition, I can apply the dynamic focus, which takes into account, again, that I'm looking at an inclined surface and the focusing of the, the exact focusing of the beam should also be corrected for, depending on, on the position. Okay, let me just zoom in a bit more. I think I need some focusing here. Uh, let me increase the contrast a bit. And now with the F6, function key, I can do some focusing. Okay, maybe I go to a slower scan speed. And I think I need some stigmation. Okay, no, maybe the other way. Ah, there we go. Okay, so now I see the membranes. Okay. That will be fine for now. Full view again. I zoom out a bit. Okay. 
let's for instance have this area for the imaging. So the aim, just to mention this again, the aim of what I'm doing here is to set up a FIPSAM 3D data acquisition, which means I'm going to mill away uh, section by section from the material here that you see here. And after milling away, for instance, 30 nanometers of material, I will acquire an SEM image. Then again, mill away 30 nanometers of material, image, and so on, such that in the end, I have an, a, a 3D data set. Okay, let's say I'm fine with the imaging part. I will now open the, the part of SmartSEM, which is used to define the, the milling area, which is called SmartFib. Let me click this button. Now I see on which monitor it's going to open. Oh, it's on the other monitor. It's on this monitor. Okay. So this is my smart FIP user interface where I can likewise acquire a FIP image. Here's my FIP image now. Let me hide those grids. And now all I need to do is just to define a milling box. Okay, so this is the FIB view now. So I'm looking um, with a FIB, I'm looking top down onto my sample surface. And the sample surface in this area consists of the uh, protection area and the trench in front of it. Okay, and my aim is to, to start milling down here with a FIB and mill away slice by slice and make an image after each slice. So for this, I need to tell the system how it should do the milling. And of course, I've prepared this, I uh, thought I had. Um, let me see, I think it should be here. Okay, here we go. So here's my recipe. It's called the serial section imaging with a slice thickness 30 nano meters i open this one okay so the whole thing team turns green which means this is an, an, an applicable recipe and you see um, over here that a 700 pico amp ion beam will be selected to do the milling i yet have to define the the dose factor to get to a deeper milling depth at the moment, I have a milling depth of one micron. Let's set it to 10 micron milling depth. In total, at least the, the milling time would now take 42 minutes. And just to note, to, to point out this, the slice thickness, which I can also modify at the moment, is set to 30 nanometers. Okay, just before I start the, 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 the job, I will just to exclude that there was a drift of the specimen, I acquire a new image, and if necessary, adjust the, the, the position of the, the box. Let's do like this. Okay, and now I'm just going to, to start the job by clicking on this arrow and start. Okay, and what is happening now is that the FIP is switching to the 700 pico amp milling beam. And after that, so here you see it's the probe is changing to 30 kV 700 pico amps. And now you see schematically that the beam is milling from the, the the bottom of this milling, milling box and after reaching 30 having milled away 30 nanometers of material it will acquire an image okay so in the meantime it has acquired an image i will in a short time switch to another monitor now it's milling again let me switch to another monitor okay this is the monitor where we will be able to see the resulting images Okay, and it is well possible that at the moment the beam has not 
yet reached the cross-section phase. So it might take a few images until it has reached the cross-section phase. Okay, so now it's, it's milling again. Now it's taking an image. Now it is milling again. Okay, and in the meantime, let's have a look at the resulting images. So this is today's stage. Okay, so these are the images that have been captured so far. And it seems like it has not yet reached the surface. So we would have to wait a bit longer until the, the beam has reached the cross-section phase and really starts to mill away uh, a 30 nanometer slice and take a new image. Oops. Okay. Okay, so the, the possibility that I in principle have here, I can I can say, okay, let me nudge the beam a bit, or I can also pause the acquisition in order to um, to, to, to zoom out a bit. Let me do this, um, zoom out. Okay, so I have a better overview, a better overview of where the beam will be in the next images. And then um, let's continue. And just for a while, I can even disable the imaging part. So it will now just continue milling without taking images. And after a while, when I think, okay, now for, for sure it has reached the cross-section phase, I will kind of um, uncheck this disable imaging and then it will redo the imaging part as well. Okay, so I uncheck this button and now in a few moments, it will take the next image. I switch the monitor. Okay, now the question, has it reached or not? I don't know. Anyway, so this is this is in a nutshell what I wanted to to show you how to quickly set up such a serial section imaging job, and as as you have seen, it's it's really done quite quickly with this method using the remote tools that I have. Let's see. Oh, okay. See now, it's milling already. Okay, so we clearly see a change between the previous and the next image. Okay, and, and with this, um, I think we are still quite in time. Okay, we, we again, again, we have a few moments for, for questions. So, can you all see my screen? Yes, that looks fine. Luca. Perfect, good. Uh, so yeah, Size Critical Service um, is a small little product which uh, is installed on your size microscope and it basically is there to protect you from unplanned downtime and to improve our remote service capabilities. Starting off with the base layer. So how do we ensure that we can protect you from unplanned downtime? I will introduce you from the data flow from data to action, basically. So first of all, what we do is with our software, we can connect or provide an infrastructure, a secure technology infrastructure um, to connect your size microscope to our server instance. In there, we are going to collect hardware and software related data. And basically with all of the collection, we are able to analyze and search for known and recognize new patterns. And at the end, we can also predict different uh, events or behaviors of your microscope and then generate actionable information for our service. And then at the end, we can act and provide a direct proactive and also prevent a support to you as customers. And at the end, we can therefore increase software and hardware uptime, also shape product roadmaps. That's for internal purposes, of course. But for you customers, uh, we can ensure to reduce unplanned downtime with predictive service. So that's a lot of, let's say, theory. Um, 
I would like to show you now how this is actually implemented into our service organization. So here you can see just um, pointer here. For instance, <clears throat> your cross beam system. And on this cross beam system, on the control PC, size predicted service is installed. And we are securely sending usage and health information to our platform. From there, our size service professionals can analyze respective data, just machine data. In terms of uh, security aspects and so on, I will come to this later on. Um, but you can be sure that it's just machine related data, nothing private. And um, our service professionals also receive proactive alerts in case certain thresholds like voltages or temperatures are met and then can connect with you as customers directly and then perform different service actions depends on what the issue is, but uh, preferably, of course, remote service. Therefore, we also have in our service organization, we have the customer support center, may you know about this already. Um, these are um, remote service specialists. So they are monitoring your system and basically can then provide remote service, for instance, through TeamViewer, if you accept that. So as uh, Andrea already showed, um, it's a lot of things are possible through TeamViewer. So maybe a on-site visit, visit is not necessary. So this reduces the time of a service visit, of course, and saves you a lot of time planning and also uh, reduces, as I said, the unplanned downtime, which uh, is to avoid. But what is in for you as customers uh, besides the more effective service is basically that you also have the opportunity to see performance insights of your system in the size portal. Not sure if you know the size portal, but the size portal is basically the interface from uh, where all of uh, your systems are. And in there, in the, system, in the section, my systems, for instance, you can see, okay, you have this cross beam and that's the current status. And depending on your service contract level, you can see more and less information here. Um, how this looks in detail, I will show it to you later on. All right, uh, just a overview of what we can actually monitor uh, now respectively for the size cross beam series. So uh, very important, of course, is the source filament and um, where we can check for health and performance indicators. We can also check the vacuum status. So um, from the gun and from the chamber, for instance, uh, also the performance of the extraction at the end. From the FIP, we can also check the source health respectively, and also respective emission characteristics. So whether the FIP works properly or not. And then at the end, also operational information. So for instance, which EHT settings were used and so on. And for all of those aspects, we can cover condition monitoring data. So just to have a live view about different parameters as I've showed you here. We also have advanced data analytics. So it's not just about collecting all of the data, it's also about processing the data, data and find yeah, anomalous patterns. And at the end, we provide proactive alerts for our service professionals, as I showed you before, and then they can approach you and check whether there is, there is an issue on your system and prevent an unplanned downtime. Moving on to also what, what you can expect as customers. So basically summarizing it, uh, we can predict problems before they happen and resolve them before they affect your research. I think that's one of the most important aspects. Uh, you can share key technical data securely with size and receive proactive customer support. And at the end, you will receive faster support from our remote service team and a faster time to repair. 
and now to the advantages at the end. Size predictor service is currently completely free of charge. So it's a service you can get without any additional costs. There is no additional hardware required. So just the operating computer from your microscope is sufficient. It's just a little software there to uh, interact with our um, server instance. There's no additional hardware required. It's operational 24 seven, 365, so all the time. And speaking of success, we have already more than 4,000 systems which are connected globally. So this really proves that our customers are, um, are sure that we use the data securely and um, provide more effective service at the end. So talking about advantages and so on, as I've promised, um, just wanted to showcase what um, you as customers can see in the size portal in the My System section. So if your system is connected to predictive service, um, in the section currently, you can see, for instance, the filament age of your source. You can see which uh, software versions is, are installed, whether it's the latest one or there's an up, upgrade maybe necessary or favorable. Also, you can see the typical EHT settings. So just to see how your system is actually used. You can also see those settings through the course of time to see any variances, maybe in the usage of the system, maybe it's in the lab or somewhere. And also you have um, estimations on the EHT on duration and different EHT on occurrences to really understand how the system is used. Just a note on that. So this is basically um, a not a first version, but um, it's still work in progress. So all if you as customers have like inquiries on which data you want to see, we're always happy to support you and expand this from, from time to time. So um, if you have more yeah, wishes basically on what you want to see in the size portal to really use the power of the portal, then just let us know and uh, we can try to, to implement those changes. And to sum it up, um, what customers can expect, also some real life feedback from our customers. So from instance, uh, at the top from Professor Jeff Long um, at the UCLA. So we detected a potential issue with an LM system, so a laser scanning microscope um, before it became a serious issue. So um, we've detected an issue on our platform and our service technician was able to uh, yeah, resolve the problem with the cooler before there was an unexpected downtime. So the research was saved basically, and this really shows the power of predictive service in this regard. And also another uh, example for a laser scanning microscope at the National University of Singapore, where we also detected anomalies within the temperature and through our constant monitoring, we were, we were able to proactively support the customer here and basically also reduce an unplanned downtime. So all of these advantages, um, I think one, as I've mentioned before, one aspect is quite important is IT security and data privacy. You may wondering, okay, you will get data from our system, but can we be sure that our personal data is safe? And for this, we have this overview here about which parameters we can actually monitor and about what we are actually not monitoring. So we can monitor the size software related stuff. So software versions, installed service packages, software exceptions, and so on. But also there are like no usernames or anything. For Windows, we can just check the version, disk space, and those kind of parameters, but also no personal related data. Then we have uh, electronic components, as I said, voltages, currents, temperatures, and mechanical components like cycles, temperatures, or like travel distances. But really personal data like usernames, experiment data, or any recipes, that's not what we're gonna transfer with size predictive service. 
And with those aspects, uh, I would hand over to Johannes. I think he joined already uh, to showcase a little bit what we are at size RMS are doing in terms of IT security. Here we go. So hi to all, um, just maybe a short intro uh, to my person. Yeah, I'm Johannes Lange. I'm the business information security officer here at Zeiss Microscopy. So that means all about cybersecurity, IT security, information security. Um, that's where I'm taking care. And yeah, so let me share my screen. I just... You should see my screen now. Yes, we can see it in presentation mode. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So yeah, information security inside my, my microscopy. We are part of uh, size in, in total. That's uh, inside microscopy, and that's also why we benefit from all the strengths uh, in size worldwide. So, uh, what does that mean? Um, that means, uh, yeah, about all the elevation of cyber capabilities to match threats and, and risk landscapes. So that means what do we have? We have a 24 seven security operation center um, as of now. So for our internal IT um, and systems, and what we are now building up is also a cyber operation center for products that we launch. So um, that means <clears throat> For, for example, predictive service. Predictive service, we are already doing very good homework there. I, I come to that on, on the next slide. Um, but then we also have the monitoring capability. So that means um, what, what happens uh, in terms of uh, yeah, checks to our systems or uh, if a hacker tries to go in, we get notified directly. Uh, and we can also stop things um, at the moment when it's uh, when it's happening, and this is also um, the next step forward. Um, what we also increase, we increase our defense cybersecurity capabilities, and we foster improved cyber resilience. And uh, let me go to the next slide, where I um, show you some some things for our product security, especially. Um, so there's three things in total. One is the governance. So we're ensuring compliance with local um, cybersecurity laws and, and regulations. So that means for Europe, for, for example, it's uh, NIS2, which uh, gets enforced, especially for Germany by mid of October. Um, then there's the Cyber Resilience Act. There is the BSE compliance, BSI, which is the German uh, Institute for uh, Security, Information Security. Then we um, are compliant against the Cyber Essentials Program in UK. Um, we are um, compliant against some NIST um, compliance rules in the US. And recently, and I don't know if Luca already also uh, said that to you, um, regarding predictive service. So the application which Luca just uh, showed you, we also have the um, we also have the, the, the cybersecurity certification from the Chinese um, government um, also um, gotten um, beginning of this year. So that means also uh, we also get certified by different uh, stakeholders for our products. That means not only for our size internal world, but also for our products. This is very important. The second thing is here SBOM and patching. SBOM is the software bill of material. So that means if you buy a, a product in grocery, uh, and you see on the packaging what it contains. Yeah, it contains nuts and and then other stuff. And here uh, we in in future say um, our um, our predictive service contains library A, B, and C. For for example, so these are th uh, third party libraries, and and we are also monitoring. And this is the second thing: a fast time to patch process. Uh, we are also actively monitoring um, on a twenty four seven basis. Um, if there is for those uh, third-party libraries, so those S bombs, um, coming some vulnerabilities, that we are um, patching it very fast. So we get notified by our system, and we are patching it very fast. Also, to not 
be vulnerable and that you are also not vulnerable to outsiders in in terms of uh yeah um trying to steal um your ip trying to um also uh, get uh, data out of it and um this is where where we're going to the third uh, thing is the cyber maturity levels that means uh we are and already, and we still want to grow in terms of a uh, um, cyber maturity for our products, for our software products here, especially, um, which means um, that we also want to go for uh, for traffic light uh, sense for all of our applications. If there is uh, vulnerabilities existing, and for the vulnerabilities, if there is patching already uh, put in, in, in into place, so it means either they're online and we directly put the, um, the patches to the system or the other ways it is offline at your site and we um, just uh, put our patches online and you can download, you can install it on, on your own. Um, so there's two ways of, of doing it, but uh, we are now creating that very fast uh, responding um, solution. And at the same time, we are also providing actively um, security documentation. So that means we are not only providing user manuals for um, our applications um, on the computers or also predictive service, for example, but we are also providing security documentation. So how are we fulfilling our governance? So which is the first point in here? What is our measures to really conduct um, and to, 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 to be compliant? So we really want to be open here also uh, that it's also um, that you can also follow how we how we follow the rules how we how we do our homework and this is uh, where we are at the moment right now and this is where we want to uh, be finalizing that um, within the next couple of months so that you are really aware of that our system is secure as it should be and uh, to the latest um, yeah state of the art so to say